Tonight, an Olympic legend with Syracuse ties who plays a sports casting trail. Marty Glickman's voice was an iconic treasure in New York. His development of the craft of TV sports play-by-play -play launched three generations of sportscasters. His legacy was celebrated at a Manhattan gala attended by SU alum. It's the focus of a new WCNY program airing next week. Glickman's Calling, next on Insight. Insight is made possible through the support of our members. As a bus driver, I'm a very important part of the community. Nothing is more important than the safety of the children. I love the kids. That's what I'm there for, to do my job and deliver them safely and securely. We are glad you could join us. I'm Jim Maroney. Enjoy the Sochi Olympic Games this week. The world is gathering again to enjoy the thrill of sport and how it can bring us together. Of course, the spectacle of the Olympics has long been about more than the medals. We do a lot of thinking about where we are as a planet when we watch athletes from tiny countries and giants compete against each other. Sport can have that effect on us even for the people who don't like the politics that get rolled in. Now, in Russia this month, there's the threat of terrorism, the scrutiny of Russia's treatment of the games, and all of its citizens, especially those who are not heterosexual. It may seem like just a grand distraction from the one one-hundredth of a second or point that we need to measure the difference between a gold and silver medalist in speed skating or gymnastics. But in the end, it is about the whole story of people and performance that make this time of every two or four years so relevant and such a powerful media experience. Marty Glickman knew that, perhaps as well as anyone. His name may not be as familiar to you as to those who know sports casting or even the history of the Olympic Games. But Marty Glickman knew how important it was to weave the story of moments like the Olympics or any game, and most importantly, how to help you see it. His work as a broadcaster started here in Syracuse, not long after he made the U.S. Olympic track team. This past year, his story was told in an HBO documentary, Glickman. Syracuse University, his alma mater, honored him at the opening of its new sports media program. At that event, WCNY recorded a compelling conversation that formed the heart of a new program that we will air Monday night. What happens when an 18-year-old kid's dreams are crushed by racism and prejudice? Do they become bitter or do they thrive? Marty Glickman not only thrived, but he used sports to transcend the divisions caused by race, class, and religion. It's such a unique story. It's such a New York story, yet it's such a global story. But sports casting is at its best when you can feel it. I mean, Marty totally embodied that. This was a worldly man. This wasn't a sports nerd. This is a guy who'd led a textured life. I knew him only as the Giants announcer. I didn't know how great an athlete he was. I was the producer of Marty Glickman's radio show, and they would say, who's Marty Glickman? And it stunned me. And I always felt that, you know, if uh, I could remedy that with this film just a little, it would have been a success. He was just so helpful to me and so many other uh, young broadcasters who were, you know, looking for that at first break. Who, who are the toughest people to uh, line up for interviews? You! <laughs> <laughs> legend. Marty was a legend. Without Marty, there's no Marv. Without Marv, there's no Dick Stockton. Without Dick Stockton, there's no Bob Costas. Without Bob, there's no Mike Tirico, there's no Sean McDonough, we go on and on. I come back and a couple days later meet with Marty in his office and he says, well let me ask you something. You're wearing some sort of cashmere overcoat. You've got a silk turtleneck on. You've got some sort of scarf. You look like a dude. It's a football game, Bob. Wear a parka, Bob. And then, then you saw that fur jacket that he oh, had yeah. on. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. He was a wonderful guy in so many ways, and he was a mentor. Till the day he died, he was a mentor to every one of us, and we all looked up to him and all had great affection for him. With all the stories in the sports page, it's not about the sports, it's about steroids, it's about uh, you know, DUIs. Marty Glickman represented the purity of sport, 
and almost a primal feeling when you first have a catch with your dad, that's what emanated from Marty's broadcast. Marty Glickman, the Olympian, would have been enough of a story to make Glickman a legend. He arrived here in central New York as a high school sprint champion from Brooklyn. His talents were so undeniable, Glickman earned a place on the 1936 United States Olympic track team that would compete at the Berlin Games. Glickman ran alongside the great Jesse Owens. It would be Owens who made the gold medal impression on Adolf Hitler. But until the documentary produced by James L. Friedman last year, many may not have known that it would be Glickman and another American sprinter who would feel the political overtones of the 36 Olympic Games. In 1935, Nazi Germany passed the Nuremberg Laws, stripping Jews of their citizenship and barring them from competing in German sports clubs, a serious violation of Olympic rules. This caused the Amateur Athletic Union whose approval was necessary to send a U.S. team to Berlin to advocate a boycott of the Games. I was aware that there were some people in America who didn't want us to go to Germany because of anti-Semitism. But I wanted to show that a Jew could do just as well as any other individual, perhaps even better. Avery Brundage, the president of the U.S. Olympic Committee, was also against the boycott, but for vastly different reasons. His great ambition was to meet Hitler. Well, Hitler was kind of a hero to him or something. Brundage would publicly denounce the boycott movement as a Jewish communist conspiracy to keep the U.S. out of the games. The Nazis couldn't conceive of 36 Olympics where an American team doesn't come. There was Germany saying to Avery Brundage, Avery, it all depends on you. He came back and said, what are you talking about? They're, the Jews are allowed to compete for the, for the German team. You've been misled. When Brundage announces that the Nazis have put Jewish track star Gretel Bergman on its Olympic team, the AAU votes down the boycott. We're off to Berlin with the largest and finest team that we have ever sent abroad. The day after the U.S. set sail for Germany, the Nazis dropped Gretel Bergman from their Olympic team. Germany has one of those made-to-order welcomes ready for America's 382 athletes. Tens of thousands give the Yankees an overwhelming reception while buses carry them to the Olympic village. Morty arrived in a Berlin that had been sanitized for its Olympic guests. All the anti-Semitic signs and posters had been removed from the city by the order of Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda. Banners and flags, they were all over the place and dominated by the swastika. This was 36 before we really got to know what the swastika truly meant. If Hitler was humiliated by the black athletes, the thought of Jews standing on the winning podium troubled him even more since it could strike a profound blow to his claims of Jewish inferiority. The next scheduled race was the 400-meter relay, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller's event, an event the Americans were so favored to win, it was said the only way they would lose was if they dropped the baton. The morning of the day we were supposed to run in the trial heats, we were called into a meeting, the seven sprinters were, along with Dean Cromwell, the assistant head track coach, and Lawson Robertson, the head track coach. And Robertson announced to the seven of us that he'd heard very strong rumors that the Germans were saving their best sprinters, hiding them to upset the American team in the 400 meter relay. And consequently, Sam and I were to be replaced by Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. We were shocked. Coach, you know, we're the only two Jews on the track team, Sam and I. We'll worry about that later, said Dean Cromwell. Sam was completely stunned. He didn't say a word in the meeting. I'm a brash 18-year-old kid, and I said, Coach, no matter who runs, we're going to win this race by 15 yards. At which point, Jesse spoke up and said, I've won my three gold medals. I'm tired. I've had it. Let Marty and Sam run. They deserve it. And Cromwell pointed his finger at him and said, You'll do as you're told. And in those days, black athletes did as they were told. 
10 a.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Boulevard Watch Time. W-A-B-C, New York. And now I see that they're blowing the whistle for the start of the 400-meter relay. Jesse Owens will start it off for the United States. If they're on their marks, they're set. They go. Watching the final, all sorts of emotions flash through my being. Metcalf is starting to move out in front now on the backstretch. I see Metcalf passing runners down the backstretch. That should be me out there. That should be me. That's, that's me out there. Pass it on now to Foy Draper of Southern California. Draper moves out in front by about seven yards, and he's going to pass it on next to Frankie Wyckoff. Wyckoff takes a beautiful start on that. He's down the stretch 15 yards out in front and running in the third lane. When you see the finish of the race, all you see is Frank Wyckoff crossing the finish line. You don't even see the second place finisher. He's out of the picture, 15 yards behind. If they had stolen Glickman in there, they might have, uh, instead of winning by 15 yards, they might have won by 14 yards. The Germans didn't finish second or third, they finished fourth. So the story given us was an out and out lie by Robertson and by Dean Cromwell. The day after the race, Marnie was walking across the Olympic Village when Lawson Robertson, the team's head track coach, spotted him. Marty, Marty. And I jogged over to him. I just want to tell you how sorry I am. I made a terrible mistake. And uh, he said he was sorry. Dean Cromwell didn't say a word, never spoke to me again. Some people believe that Dean Cromwell was only looking after his USC Trojans, Draper and Wyckoff, and that track politics was the reason Glickman and Stoller were dropped. Frank Wyckoff disagreed with that assessment. Down in my heart, I think it was done the way it was because of the Jewish thing. I'm sorry, but I believe that. Ralph Metcalf added, of course I'm convinced it was the Jewish thing that was behind it. Glickman and Stoller should have run. Others blame Avery Brundage, believing he removed the two Jewish runners to appease Hitler. Brundage dismissed any accusations of foul play, writing in his official report on the 1936 games. An erroneous report was circulated that two athletes had been dropped from the American relay team because of their religion. This report was absurd. The two athletes were taken only as substitutes. Two years later, when the Nazis were building the German embassy in Washington, D.C., they awarded the construction contract to Avery Brundage. In the entire history of the modern Olympic Games, no fit American track and field performer has ever not competed in the Olympic Games, except for Sam Stoller and me, the only two Jews on the 1936 team. As much as Marty Glickman's Olympic experience would make you think it is his storied legacy as a broadcaster and the family tree of sportscasting that grew because of him, that drew some of the craft's best to New York last summer. His protege, Marv Albert, and fellow Syracuse University alum Bob Costas sat down with Jim Friedman to share more of what made Glickman one of broadcasting's grand masters. What do, you, what do you remember most about dealing with Marty in that role? Well, first of all, like you, I grew up listening to him. So first of all, it's, hey, here's Marty Glickman, and he cares about me, and he knows my name, and he's familiar with my work. But how there was no ego at all. I mean, when people in our profession have just a little ego and just a little pretense, that's noteworthy. In his case, none at all. He honestly wanted you to be as good as you could possibly be. He reveled in your success. Um, it was never about him, except to the extent that he wanted to impart whatever his own experience had, had led him to know, and, and he wanted to share it with you. Uh, he wanted you on television to be as spare as possible, and he understood the difference between radio and television um, and wanted you to put captions beneath the pictures on television as opposed to painting the entire picture, which he was so capable of doing on radio. And that distinction was important to him. Around 1983, before I started hosting the, the pregame show, I was doing play-by-play -play of games with Bob Trumpy. And it was a cold December day in New England. And after the game, I come back and a couple days later meet with Marty in his office and he says, Keed 
And he often, you knew your name, but he'd go, Keed, K-E-E-D. Um, and Keed, it was a, another good broadcast. But let me ask you something. You're wearing some sort of cashmere overcoat. You've got a silk turtleneck on. You've got some sort of scarf. You look like a dude. I see, you look like a dude. It's a football game, Bob. Wear a parka, Bob. <coughs> yeah, yeah, this isn't the cover of Gentleman's Quarterly, Bob. And then, then you saw that fur jacket that he had on the <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. So I don't know. You spent, what, about four, four years, right? Working Close on the project. To, yeah. what, what were your realistic hopes for the film? You know, I, I always, when I was doing the film, uh, when I first, I moved to the Midwest and later uh, to California, and, and people would say, what's the best job you ever had? And I said, I once, I, I, I was the producer of Marty Glickman's radio show. And they would say, who's Marty Glickman? And it stunned me, because outside of New York, he, had, he was known by very few people. And I always felt that, you know, if uh, I could remedy that with this film just a little, it would have been a success. And that's how I feel. I always knew uh, his story was so incredible. I knew I would sell this. I never dreamed Scorsese, you know, would get involved. But I, I wanted his story told. It deserved, this man's story deserved to be her. Actually, at the time, and I'm, I, I'm certain you started in radio, mm -hmm. uh, the St. Louis Spirits, right? right. ABA and then it was TV. But you have the feeling it's so different now. When you did radio, you felt you were the game. Definitely. I mean, that, that's, it's so different because in television, you're really setting up the person you're working with. And mm -hmm. it's less talk. And Marty always used to deal with that aspect. And all in the first generation of television, and probably into the second, all the great television sportscasters were actually radio right. broadcasters who just cut it back appropriately, whether it was Lindsey Nelson or whether it was Vin Scully or, or Marty or Mel Allen or Red Barber, whoever it might be, they all had begun in radio. And I don't know anybody who started in television who became then a good play-by-play -play man on radio. But I know zillions of guys who started in radio, developed the full skill set, and then just tapered it back and adjusted it for TV. Jim, you brought it up in the film. Uh, to me, that was always the fascinating part, that, uh, that Marty, with his radio description, it's left baseline, right baseline, top of the circle, uh, it's right side of the lane. You drive down the lane, drive across the lane. And, and he was so unusual because, as Mike had mentioned, and uh, we all touched on the fact that uh, he set the terminology. I mean, there was no basketball terminology right. in terms of broadcast before yeah. Marty. It's, you know, uh, people said, how did he affect your film? And he couldn't affect my film because he's not here today. But what I did was he was so, the sparseness of language, he couldn't stand when an announcer talked too much. He had that right. famous line, the only one who tunes in to hear a broadcast is the broadcaster's mother, you know. <laughs> and, and so I wrote the narration of this film as if Marty was in my ear and just cut and cut and cut till it was so sparse because that's what Marty Glickman would have wanted. Bob, did he ever discuss your uh, doing Olympics on, on television? Did he ever talk to you about it? Yeah, and I remember on one occasion, I mean, he was generally approved of it. On, on one occasion, he called me during the Olympics. Generally approved. <laughs> generally approved. He, not, yeah. not, uh, and, and was said, it the clothing, or was it just <laughs> 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 it, it, the, by, by then, the wardrobe was OK by Marty, mm -hmm. but um, he, he felt at times that I was too matter of fact. And sure. actually, he was onto something because <clears throat> there were times when I felt, and please don't anyone take this out of context because NBC's broadcast of the Olympics en encompasses so much, and the producers do such a remarkable job with the stories and whatnot. But because we're trying to hold an audience, there's sometimes a line crossed between the legitimate drama and theater of sports and going into melodrama and, and hype. Any network that does an Olympics is going to do that from time to time. And when I see that happening around me, the only thing I can do, I'm not going to directly diss it. These are my colleagues and my friends, and for the most part, they do a wonderful job. The way I kind of protected myself, at least in my own mind, was to be a little pulled back from it, a little detached from it, and be more matter of fact. But sportscasting is at its best when you can feel it. I mean, Marty totally embodied that. This was a worldly man. This wasn't a sports nerd. This is a guy who'd led a textured life, 
but he felt like a fan, and he, he conveyed the pulse of the game. When you heard Marv do the great Nick teams, his voice, okay, was attached to the game. That staccato style matched the way the Knicks played, and you could feel the game. And I think sports casting is at its best. Jim McKay, when he hosted the Olympics, you could feel his almost boyish excitement, even into his 60s and 70s. And you could feel his heartbreak when he described and, and chronicled what was going on in Munich in 1972. And there have been times during the Olympics, I don't think most of the time, but there have been times during the Olympics, almost as a defense mechanism, when I've kind of, I've kind of gone into, I've relied more on craftsmanship than on a visceral feeling. And Marty was so perceptive and picked up on that. He said, I, I want to feel your heart more. I want to see you smile more. And he was right. WCNY and its Access Video team produced that program remembering Marty Glickman, a sports casting pioneer. WCNY producer Doug Moreau interviewed the sports casting A-listers who turned out to pay tribute to the film Glickman and the man who many credited with developing modern sports play-by-play -play for TV. What did you learn about this person who, you know, if you were a sports fan and you are, you know of him, but probably not in the depth that you learned spending time around these people? I learned a little bit about what human nature is capable of. And what I mean by that, is here, here's a teenager, Marty Glickman, who basically gets snubbed uh, out of running in the Olympics. And he comes back and later on in life, you know, he, he is a mentor to the greats of the broadcasting profession. He, he's, he may be a little bitter, but he is just, he comes back and he wants to teach other people what he knows. People like Marv Elbert, people like Jim Friedman. I just learned the capacity of a human being to do that after being, he, he could have just been so bitter and not wanted any part of that. Um, it was remarkable. That's what I learned. Now, you know, getting back to all the sportscasters, and I know that you interviewed Marv. Yes. And, and it, it can be easy to be distracted from, from what you're there to do. And, and, and you experienced that. You shared that with me earlier. I did. Well, I, I'm sitting and talking to Marv, and, and through my lifetime, Marv has been the voice of the Knicks. Uh, so I know I have to explain to him about, um, you know, talk to, ask questions about Marty Glickman to Marv. Uh, but inside, I'm thinking, huh, I wonder who Marv thinks the greatest Nick of all time is. <laughs> so I, I never asked that question. But yes, you do get distracted with uh, big names like that and wanting to, to go a different route. But uh, I I kept myself from doing that. As one of the producers of the show, you know what we, the audience, didn't get to see about that night in Manhattan. What comes to mind? <laughs> the camaraderie of all the Syracuse University alumnus there. And uh, the best example of that, uh, when I sat down with uh, Sean McDonough, and he was telling me a story about him and Iron Eagle and how they used to, they traded name tags over in the step and repeat room. <laughs> and so these famous broadcasters, and, and mind you, one has hair and the other doesn't, um, have different name tags on. And people were coming up and introducing themselves, and they really thought that each one of them was the other person. It just showed me, you know, they weren't close just as broadcasters, but they really do act like they're still in college with each other yeah. uh, because yeah. they all went to Syracuse. And this was more than just a public appearance by you know, the, the headliners. Bob, Bob Costas extremely moved. And, and I think that's something. And he had a, he had a little uh, comedic moment there <laughs> during the presentation. You, you want to go through that? Yeah, as he was talking, the, um, the uh, stand or the, um, the logo on his stand uh, fell in the middle of it and so he's trying to reach down and grab it and, and stop it and he's like and Syracuse spared no expense and so everybody laughed and he, he handled that moment quite well sure. uh, as a true professional he is. Yeah. That he and, and everybody in that room kind of came from this tree, this a tree created by this person who as you said overcame a little bit at an early age. Mm -hmm. that, that must have been you know a different experience for someone who's, who's told a lot of stories. Yeah, you know, Mike Trigo said it best, and, and he said, you know, it, this is a New York story. And it really, he wasn't talking about New York City. He was talking about all of New York. It, the tree starts in Syracuse University. And I think that everybody, at least in, in, in the East Coast, knows what Marty meant to them. Uh, they, they grew up with Marty. And if they didn't grow up with Marty, they grew up with Marv. And so the ones that were uh, said, well, I really didn't see or I really didn't hear Marty, but I, but I heard Marv, and, and Marv, that's his mentor. Mm -hmm. So that's why they wanted to be there. So the, the tree has so many branches on it, and it really was a special night. 
Syracuse University marked that August evening in Manhattan with the launch of the new House Sports Media Center. It presented the first Marty Glickman Award for Leadership in Sports Media, and that went to Costas, the 74 Newhouse alum who a lot of us have watched guide us through the last generation of Olympic Games. Costas called it one of the greatest honors of his life. Learn more about Costas, Albert, and the man who inspired them this Monday when WCNY presents Remembering Marty Glickman, a sports casting pioneer. It debuts at 9 p.m. Check your listings for encore air dates. You can also find the documentary on the great broadcaster's life by watching Jim Friedman's Glickman. You can find that at GlickmanTheFilm.com. Now to learn more about our show, head to WCNY.org or if you have a comment, find us at Facebook and Twitter. Next week on Insight, will the icy winds that cross the St. Lawrence turn wind turbines soon? A tiny Jefferson County community faces a deadline on that very decision. What would stop Cape Vincent from going to a green energy grid? We'll have that story next week. For all of us here at WCNY, we're glad you checked in. We'll see you next week. Insight is made possible through the support of our members. I love making my patients happy. It's giving love away. They're always telling me that I'm their favorite nurse. My residents are very grateful. It makes me want to keep going.